I want to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> when we get together or when we come to church or we get together at a ministry event or a Bible study or whatever it is. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, you know, when we come to church, we, we probably hope for something. There's, you know, encourage me today, Lord, or uh, let somebody help me today, or, you know, we have needs, we have interests of our own, and those are not, those are not necessarily wrong. But I want to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> church is not about you. It's about the Lord. And it's about the other people around us. It doesn't mean that we can't admit that we have a need or that you're hoping and praying some good thing would happen, some blessing in your life while you get together, whether it's during the week or this morning or a Sunday morning or whatever it is. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we can hunger and thirst and we should pray and we should ask. But there's this thing that sometimes we get fixated on what we want, what we expect, and we don't come for the Lord at all. We come for his blessing, or we come with expectation, and uh, we don't come for other people. We come for, what can I get? I want you to know that coming to church is it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about all the other people in this room, secondly. And firstly, it's, it's about the Lord. It's about coming in and recognizing Him and acknowledging Him and calling out to Him and giving thanks to Him. And, and what is it that He wants to do or what is it that He wants to say? Oh, how is it that He w- might want to use me today or instruct me or correct me or encourage me? Yes, but it's not just about me. And we should come with expectation and we should come with our needs, but if we fixate just on what do I get at church, what do I like, we're missing what gathering together is about. And so I want us to look at several scriptures this morning. This, this sermon is not going to be a, here's one point, here's two point, here's three points. I really just kind of want to talk with us and remind us of some things and, and that you would walk out and not say, oh, wow, that was quite a sermon, uh, but rather walk out and just say, you know, I feel like the Holy Spirit has pointed out some things to me through pastor just kind of chatting with us today. And there's some things that I need to have him change in me. Those things I recognize today. And not walk out with guilt, but walk out with a fresh reminder and an understanding of what what should happen when we get together and where should our interests lie and where should our focus lie. And so I want to read this to you because there's passages throughout Old Testament and New and certainly the New, the coaching of how, you know, what happens that when the church, these disciples of Christ, converts, you know, get together, and what's the attitude and outlook that we should have? And there's little indications all throughout the scripture. I mean, one that I'm going to, well, here, I'll, I'll just do it this way. Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter 5, um, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with verse 15. Just kind of put this segment together. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of time or the season we live and the day in which we live, because these days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another. I want you to catch that, addressing one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's, there's a lot in this passage. The two things I want to just pull out this morning um, is in light of, you know, when we get together, it's not about us. So as we read this passage, it says, Speak to one another. 
In other words, when we come to this place, we should be looking towards others, for others, and we should be speaking words of Scripture and words of encouragement and words that inspire. And I know when we come to church, we think, you know, I have some expectations. What about me? Is somebody going to talk to me? Is somebody going to notice me? Is somebody going to help me? Is, I mean, after all, it's a church. They should be compassionate. They should notice when I'm in trouble or hurting. And they should come to me. And they should help me out. And if I have a need, they should answer it. Or if there's something going on, it's the church. It should always be free. And what about my needs? And what about me? I'm facing a problem. They should help me. And I want you to know that there's a measure of truth in those thoughts. But what corrupts it is this motive behind it, this attitude behind it, that comes with some kind of expectation. Because we're making the gathering about us and what we get what I get to feel and what I like. The scripture says when you get together, you should address one another. In other words, don't be sitting there thinking, well, who's going to talk to me today? Who's going to notice me today? No, the question is, who are you noticing and who are you going to talk to? It doesn't say sit back here and wait for someone to address you. It says address one another, talk to one another, approach one another with these songs and these things that, that speak of the Lord and bring hope to other people. It's not about what I get or what I don't get at church. The, the, that portion, it wraps up and says, submit yourself or subject yourself to one another. In other words, be humble towards one another. It's your preference, not just mine. It's not just my way. I want to listen to you. Listen, why don't you ask the question and let them tell their story instead of dominating the conversation all about your life and your story or how hard it is. Now, I know there's a time that we've got to share and people can listen and they can pray for us. I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen at all, but if that's all it is, if that's what dominates you, if that's what you begin to be known for, we're making church about me. It's not about me. Church isn't about you. It's about the Lord and all the people around you. That's the primary focus and the secondary focus. I want you to, I want you to consider those things. You know, well, went to that church, they're not very friendly, they didn't talk to me. Well, who did you go talk to? Who'd you reach out to? Well, I didn't get any encouragement at all at church this morning. No, no. Who did you encourage? Who did the Lord use you to reach, encourage, inspire, comfort, show compassion, care, mercy? Who did you forgive? Who did you bring hope to? Who did you share joy with? What joy did you bring somebody? That's how we're supposed to address and meet one another. And these kinds of words, you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he wrote something pretty interesting to this young pastor, Timothy. It's in the second letter of Timothy. It's in chapter 3. And now I want you to know as I read this, this, does not, this is not what Paul is writing or the Spirit is writing through Paul about the world. We already know how the world lives. So listen to this. He says, But understand this, Timothy, in the last days there's going to come difficult times. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive. Now listen, remember what I just said? This is not, he's not describing what the world looks like. The world already looked like that. Just like our world, those who don't believe in Christ. This, these are things that describe those who don't know Christ and don't live according to his purpose, his character, his values, any of that. The world already looks like this because of sin. He's writing this and saying, you, you watch, in the last days, these are attributes 
that are going to slip into people who call themselves believers or gather as a church because they're making it about themselves. Listen to this. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Listen, we come to church with all kinds of expectations. I want you to know right now, if you come like that, you are going to be disappointed. Some of your expectations might be met, but you come with all kinds of expectations on people. And how they should notice you and treat you. And after all, you're walking around with your hand out. How can they not notice? I mean, I don't have money. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. And you just go from person to person. And all you do is talk about your need. Talk about your need. Talk about your need. And then somebody, well, they're going to say, oh, hey, yeah. And then you say, finally. Now, who did you come and give to? We have needs, and it can be appropriate on settings that you can make it known, but if that's all you're doing is hanging around and talking about all the stuff you can't do and all the stuff you can't afford and all this, really? That's what you came to church for. You come with expectations or you think, well, they're the church, so they have to. I'm going to take advantage of their obligation as a Christian to be like Christ. And you're going to walk away disappointed and frustrated and angry and resentful or criticize the church or the Christians. And the reality is this, it's not their fault. You set up your own trap that snared you because you came with expectations and wrong motive and you made church about you. Somebody turn to somebody and say, wow. Wow. Ouch. I hope those other people in the sanctuary are listening to this. <laughs> They'll be slanderous, without self control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. What a great phrase. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness. See, he's talking about the church. Have the appearance. They'll do some nice things. Uh, They'll throw some money in the plate. They'll do this. They'll do that. They're going to have the appearance that, man, they are a disciple. They have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. Because they don't allow the flow of God's power to go through their life because of all this junk in their heart. It says avoid such people. Well, that would bring a real division of fellowship, wouldn't it? Listen, I'm wondering as we go through that list... And it's not just that list. It's everything that looks and would fit with that list. I wonder if there's any attribute in there, any corrupt thing in there that might start to indicate to describe me or you. First Corinthians um, chapter 11. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, This passage is about communion, but it's interesting. There's an indication here of how we're supposed to be mindful of other people. And it's near the closing of this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse, we'll go 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. You see, they had these things, agape feasts or love feasts, where they'd bring food, they'd gather together. They'd sing, they'd worship, they'd pray, they'd celebrate communion, they'd eat a meal together, and they'd just fellowship together. It was a Christian feast. And Paul started out this whole passage by saying, listen, your meeting together does more harm than it does good. 
Listen, there's something so practical here that you think, why would the Scripture even talk about this? But I want you to know that God cares about principles, and He cares about character in our life. Look at this. He says, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. A courtesy. Wasn't just jump into that buffet line first, get all you can, and go sit down somewhere and start eating while other people are waiting. Now, in our culture, there are, you know, we may get together and we go through and get our food and go and sit down and we begin to eat and others go through the line and it's part of a culture and a, and a politeness here. But it, what they were doing wasn't that. He says, you wait for one another. You show courtesy to one another. You respect one another. This isn't just about you feeding your belly. He says, you think about other people. In doing so, you don't bring judgment on yourself, but you glorify the Lord and treating other people and being mindful of them. Look at how practical this gets. He says, listen, you wait for one another. If any one of you is hungry, let him eat at home. See, what would happen at these meetings is they'd come all hungry, bring their dish, and they just couldn't hurry up to eat most of that dish they brought. This is what was going on. He says, listen, you that hungry, you pre-eat. You eat at home before you go to the feast so that you take an appropriate amount, that you're mindful of others, you respect others, you care for others. Be humble. He says, you're that hungry? You don't say, oh, I'm waiting for that feast, boy. I'm going to get on in there. <laughs> sure hope they got those big plates. Now with the dividers, mm-mm, that takes up room. Get it all on there. So listen, you get together at these, you're hungry, eat at home. So that when you come together, you will not fall under some kind of judgment. That you won't represent the Lord in humility and thoughtfulness of other people. I love this. He says, about other things, I'll give you directions when I come. In other words, he's got a whole bunch of things he wants to tell them. Because they're getting together was doing more harm. We think, what spiritual thing is so? You bring food, they get in line, they eat. Ah, so they didn't wait for one another. Ah, big deal. Listen, all kinds of relational entrapments and rudeness and lack of courtesy. This is not what the, that's not what this feast is about. This feast was about coming and focusing on the Lord and focusing on other people. Something as simple as a getting together and having a meal. And it was ruined by people. Or people thinking, I've been coming longer. I should get in line first. I've been around. I do more work around here, so I get cuts. I get this. I get it was about them. Talk about ruining a party. Talk about being selfish. Paul wrote about this. He said, you're harming each other. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Is that how you came this morning? Who's that person sitting in my seat? Don't they know I always sit there? It's my seat. I don't need to have my name on it. It's where I want to sit. Ha! Ha! church at worship. I ain't coming for worship. They never sing my favorite songs. Well, I can stay for worship. I ain't saying for that sermon. Not on the Sundays where that preacher wears blue jeans. <laughs> You'll be gone most Sundays. Anyhow, <laughs> I throw a matching jacket and pants on every now and then. I can't appease everybody. I'm not trying to offend anybody. It's not my goal. 
Well, I'm going to wear those blue jeans because I know it makes someone so angry. Ha, ha, ha. That conversation does not happen at the door of my closet. <laughs> you come with expectations you're making about you, making about your preferences, making about what you want, what songs you like. I want you to know that I don't do that. There are songs we sing here that I'm not crazy about. So what? So what? There's songs here I like that we shouldn't sing here. <laughs> Amarillo by morning. That's just because my truck says Amarillo on the side. I didn't really know that song until somebody brought it up, then I had to listen to it. Then I went, oh, George Strait. Huh, not, oh, amen. We got an amen from the name of George Strait. Oh, my goodness. I don't know who that was over here, but there's a lot of room at the altar. Oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move along. Listen, this isn't just about you or your preference, your expectation. You're supposed to come here. This is about the Lord first. It's about other people. That's the kind of attitude and what should happen when we get together. Philippians 2. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, it doesn't say you shouldn't look to your interests at all. It just says don't look only to your own interests. Look to the interests of others, what they might have to say and how they feel about it, what they think about it, what they're going through. Or is it just about you? I mean, if we want to be the living church here on earth, I think we better get together and focus on the Lord. And look at the interests of others. You know, sometimes we feel when we look at the interests of others and we just discover, well, that's not for us, then we just look at our own interests and say, well, I'm not going or I'm not going to attend or I'm not going to do this. Or, I don't like it. I'll tell you, when we come and we focus on the Lord and we looked at the interests of others, it's, it's amazing how wonderful that can turn out. And when we do that, the Lord sees the purity of that in our heart. We come for Him and we come for other people. It's amazing how He begins to meet our needs and our interests in us. It's amazing. Instead of coming with our hand out and wearing it on our sleeve about, oh, can you see how I feel? I'm, I'm kind of moping today. Oh, not really. I'm okay. Give me. I need an answer. I mean, after all, this is the church. You should take care of me. Who are you taking care of? Who are you caring for? Are you caring for the interests of the Lord? What he wants to do? Are you looking at caring for the interests of others? You know, Friday, I had a marvelous time eating a meatloaf sandwich. See, Friday, worked and did some things in the morning and then said to my wife, you want to go to lunch? So we went to lunch and I, I took her to, I took her to uh, 
a tea house in Westby. It's a place for women. I, I was the only man in, in that Victorian tea house. Order the meatloaf sandwich. It was the most manly sounding thing that I could find on the menu just to make sure that I didn't lose any masculinity walking into the place. You know, it's old furniture and old decorations and it's pretty and then some other stuff that's newer but they try to make it look old and there's just women in different rooms eating and talking and because the wood floors are hard, everything echoes and, you know. Well, my wife likes this place. I can understand why, knowing her interests. I chose to take her there because I am an outstanding husband <laughs> in the region. No, I'm kidding. No, it's her and she likes it. You know, I even ordered tea. Orange spice tea. Found out you put a little sugar in that. Wow, now that tastes good. That was sweet. It was good. Not enough to make me go back every week, but it was good. <laughs> of course, you know, I'm taking her there because she likes it, and she orders whatever foo-foo sandwich or whatever is on the menu, <laughs> and uh, ordered my tea. Of course, you know, being married to me, I'm going to annoy her just a little bit. Because I can, you know, you can hear kind of through the room when you talk, because, you know, whatever, it reverberates off the ceiling and hard walls and floor. And so I. <laughs> she's like, don't you, don't be smart. Don't you, don't. you know, I, I just, I just, and I did it just one more time. <laughs> I, I, after she, don't you, you know. <laughs> And of course, that day, she was a day on her calendar to get pumpkins and mums. You know, got to get pumpkins and set them outside and put mums around them and decorate. And I'm thinking, why? Why? You know our dog's going to come out, grab the mums, drag them across the yard, going to be in pieces, dirt here and there. You're going to get mad at the dog, and you get upset with me, and your whole afternoon's ruined. And these pumpkins, I discovered something. It's not about the shape of the pumpkin for my wife. It's about how the vine grew off the pumpkin and how long and short they cut those. You know, it's got to have a doesn't matter if the pumpkin's a little, it's all about the handle. So I'm looking through pumpkins. You know, she's got to have some extra large ones, got to look through the large, got to get the me small ones. And then, of course, you know, you got to get the tiny ones and along with the gourds because she's out there setting together on the cart and saying, I think I'm going to set these on the dining table. Well, can you eat those? So we're, you know, so I'm taking pumpkins. I'm, I mean, I'm even, I am leaning over the big cardboard thing out at the, wherever this shop is in Coon Valley. Moving pumpkins here. And, oh, you know, you know that one? You can't see part of it back. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and we're digging out pumpkins and, because she's interested in this. And we're going to bring them home. And we're going to set this uh, stuff outside my house. This crap. <laughs> I had a great time. I had a great time with my wife. I ate in a tea house, had a meatloaf sandwich that was really good, had orange tea that was marvelous down to Coon Valley and picked up almost every pumpkin. 
went through the 35-minute decision on what mum to buy. Other than a color difference, which is like maybe four options. What do you think of this one? Now, I have to be honest with you. I wasn't totally honest with her because I'd have said, well, it looks just like the rest of them. You know? <laughs> well, that one's pretty nice. Well, the one side's kind of, you know, kind of didn't grow right. Oh, yeah, okay. 35 minutes to pick out a mom. I'm having a great time with her. She likes it. You see, when we come for the sake of interest of other, it's amazing how good a time we can have. I had a good time with her. I mean, I can wait till next year to do it again, but I mean, it was a good time. <laughs> Picking out pumpkins and mums and, you know, the interesting thing about it is she was doing this and we were into it. I discovered I had an opinion about some of it. She sucked me in. I had a great time, great afternoon, and when we got home, I wasn't pulling into the driveway going, now she better get out and thank me, and she better hug me and give me a kiss and go in and iron my socks, because, I mean, I was really good today. No, I did it because I sought out her preference and her interest. See, because church isn't just here. It's in our home. And how we look to the Lord first in our life and how we look to the interests of others and what's their preference. And it's amazing how satisfying and nurturing and refreshing that happens in our own soul that you and I need that we kind of come to hope that we get. And it happens as we honor the Lord and look at, for other people. I'm going to read this to you. James chapter 3. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly and unspiritual. And he's talking about jealousy and selfish ambition. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Listen. You can come to church and we have expectation or we're like, well, how come they didn't ask me to do that? And how come they're not doing this what I suggested? And how come, and, you know, and it's all about you. And all of a sudden we take offense at what they do or don't do or re-resent and all of this. And you listen, when there's this selfish ambition at work, it leads to ongoing disorder spiritually in our life and how other things play out in our life. And I want you to know, if you're experiencing disorder and, and things that are hectic and they're just all over the place, come back, instead of trying to fix that, come back to the root of that and start here. Is there some selfish ambition in me that it's got to be my way? And they're wrong and their opinion doesn't matter. And we start looking at my way what I want, what I expect. This is what, what fulfills me. Therefore, this is what should happen. If it doesn't happen, I'm done. I'm not going. I'm not attending. I'm not going to be a part of it. And I'm going to talk bad about it and complain to other people. Yep, and I'm going to find some other people who agree with me, and then we can complain together. I want you to go back to what Paul wrote. Your getting together does more harm than it does good. We're called to be the living church on earth. We get together, it's supposed to be a, a love feast. It's supposed to be done right. I don't want you to walk out guilty or condemned this morning. I want you to walk out reminded 
of how we're supposed to come to church and gatherings and Bible studies and ministry events and we get together with other Christians and unbelie- or other believers. We come together. It's supposed to be first about the Lord. Secondly, what can, we, what can I do? How can I be used? How can I encourage? How can I help meet a need? How can I, how can I, how can I? Not, well, this ain't doing much for me. I didn't get nothing. How come they didn't? How come they didn't? And why don't they? You see, when we come here, we're supposed to be a host and a hostess. I'm going to tell you this one last thing. I do pre-marriage coaching. Couples are coming. They're preparing to get married. And it's whether they're young adults or they're a different stage of life and they're looking at getting married, widow, widower, whatever the situation is, they're getting married. We do pre-marriage coaching. And we'd spend time on, you know, where they might need some encouragement or some awareness. And one of the things that we do, of course, is we talk about the ceremony. Makes sense? And they focus on the ceremony. We go through things at the ceremony and I... And I listen to them, and I take these ingredients, and then I throw some suggestions out to them to think about so that they can be a good host and hostess because they come in and they understand it's our day, it's their day, it's her day. And then I have to remind them that, yes, this is your wedding day, and it's your day. But it's not about you. And I have brides going, when I'm telling them it's your day, and they're just like, I know it's right. And she looks at him, and he just goes. Because he just wants to show up and say, I do, and be gone, you know, generally speaking. He doesn't say that to her. Yes, whatever you'd like. I'm good with that. You know, he's preparing himself for the day of pumpkins and mums. So, I sit with them. We go through the ceremony. And, then, and I'll suggest things to them. I'll say, well, how many people do you plan on attending your ceremony? And they'll say, oh, I don't know, 180. Just throw a number out there. And then we go through some things, and at the end, announcements, and what are you going to do between there and the reception? And, and, and she'll say, we're going to have a receiving line. And I say, oh, okay. Now, I want to just give you some information. Now, if receiving line's really important to you, you can go ahead and do this. But if 180 people show up, that receiving line is going to take a while. And I said, have you ever been in a wedding with about 200 people and you sat near the back and in the middle of a long pew or bench or whatever, a row of chairs? And the wedding's over, and then they start dismissing you row by row, and you discover they're having a receiving line. And you are in that sanctuary, and then the air AC goes out. And you're hot. And you're there. And you love this couple, but you're starting to go, oh, I can't, can't keep waiting. Because you understand, people don't just come up and go, congratulations, congratulations, and then they're out to their vehicle. Because Aunt Gladys is in line. And she comes up. Oh, honey, you look so beautiful. And oh, you're just, oh, I'm so proud of you. Oh, and he, oh, he looks so handsome. Listen, when she was three years old, <laughs> and she's got 169 people behind her yet. That receiving line's not going fast. I said, listen, this is your wedding day. But it is not about you. It is about your guests. And I look at the dude and I say, listen, your buddies are coming. And they're happy for you that you're getting married. But if you make them wait and wait and wait and do... Th- listen... They're going to be really unhappy. They're already a little unhappy because you have totally wasted one of their Saturdays. And he's going, yeah, you're right. I said, so, you know, if you've got 75 people receiving line, no problem. You're getting over 100 or whatever. Listen, this is going to be longer than you think. I've had brides sit there and say, well, do you have a receiving line? Well, that might be 20 minutes. I said, huh? 
20 minutes? You think you can get 20 people through a receiving line in 20 minutes? Oh, no. Now with Aunt Gladys <laughs> and Uncle George and whoever else, I said, listen, they're coming. They're taking time of their day to support you. And you don't want them to feel trapped in that room where they're thinking, where is the exit? Can I slip out? Make it look like I'm having a coughing spell. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And really, they're sneaking out and going out the end of the building and say, I'll see them at the reception. I said, they feel like a heel. They feel obligated. They don't want to be rude. I said, listen, you, and you're not going to be late to your reception. I know it's your reception. But this is like having a party that you're hosting. You think about your guests. You don't show up. You don't. You, dinner's at five, and it's five thirty-two, and you guys still haven't arrived, and they're waiting. I said, "You will show up at your reception on time." I said, "This is your special day. I get it, but it is not about you." The vows and that part of the ceremony, yes. After that, you are a host and a hostess, and you're going to take care of people. You see, when we come to church. It's about being a host and a hostess to other people, a host and hostess to the Lord that he would come in and his presence would be in this place and he would make a difference in our lives by showing up and that we come as a host and hostess like you would receive people into your home. You're interested. You want to reach out to them. You want to connect with them. You want them to have a good experience. You want them to have a genuine comfort and you want them to be fed or be given something they walk away with and say, that was a really good time. See, that's the living church on earth. We get together, we focus on the Lord, and next is other people, because it's not about me.